the air could speak. Imagine if we could give a voice to our oceans. Or imagine if, if a pipeline could let us know when it was feeling down. Or, or a river could say, hey, there's an oil spill upstream. What if a bridge could send an email to the Department of Transportation and Works and say, hey, I've been washed out. Or like most of us, you know, the spring runoff is killing me. Well, the thing is, there's technology being de developed right now that'll make most of this possible. Like the internet before it, the internet of things is going to change how we fundamentally interact with our environment. But we've got a long ways to go, and we've got a few challenges before we get there. So our first challenge is breathing, which seems like it shouldn't really be a challenge, right? But about a month and a half or so ago, the World Health Organization released a report on air pollution and its impact on human health. In 2012, one in eight people who died, died as a result of air pollution exposure. It's one in eight people. And you have a look at this image of China, you can kind of understand why. And we probably don't worry about air pollution too much here in St. John's, on the east coast of Canada and the North Atlantic. We're miles away from industrial activity. And yet last summer, there were fires in Labrador. And strong winds blew the smoke from the fires in Labrador a thousand kilometers. And guess what? Suddenly going for a jog in St. John's is a health hazard. Imagine what it was like in Labrador. To walk down the street would be like smoking a pack of cigarettes. It's really hard to turn on the TV these days, and, and we see images all the time of oil spills. Like this one, Mayflower, Arkansas, March 2013. Oil is literally flowing down the streets. Water. So again, we don't water, worry about water too much in Newfoundland. We have an abundant supply. This spring, we've got more than our fair share of water. Generally speaking, our mar marine environment is pristine, and yet, in 1985, the Manola Cell sank off the coast of northern Newfoundland. And after 28 years of lying there dormant with 500 tons of fuel oil and diesel on board, last year fishermen started seeing oil in the water and birds coming up on shore. They're, these are, are really, really big global issues. But they can have a more local and a more personal impact. So a number of years ago, I was, uh, I was living in California. I was pretty lucky. I lived in Santa Monica, about four and a half blocks from the beach. The great thing about living four and a half blocks from the beach is instead of grabbing a morning coffee before you go to work, you can go down for a morning surf. So I grab my surfboard and I go down and hop in the water. And I don't know if you're, anyone here has been lucky enough to visit or live in California. But it's, um, I mean, the scenery is absolutely spectacular. You're just sitting out there in the water. You'll have dolphins swimming past you. And you're looking at the backdrop of the mountains and the palm trees. It's, it's really spectacular. So one morning, I, I, I go back home, and I had a, a hose hooked up outside so I could hose myself off from the salt water. And I had a couple of hummingbirds that actually used to live in the back garden. And they would hover off of my shoulders as I sprayed my, off my wetsuit. And uh, they'd just hang out and use me like a human bird bath, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> so I go in grab a bath, take out the wetsuit, and I notice afterwards that in the tub there's all these little uh, balls of what I thought was mud, so I, I go to try to clean them up, and, and it wasn't mud, it was like an oily, tarry substance. So my wetsuit was full of oil and tar. So that's not bad for me, right? I can go rinse off and get cleaned up, but I, just, I often wonder about those dolphins. I mean, this is their habitat. This is what they have to live with and deal with. So I'm going to fast forward to about four years ago. Myself and, and a couple of friends um, started talking about business ideas. I'd moved back from overseas, and I'm a geek. I love technology. I love data. Not as much as Allison likes food, but <laughs> I like data. So we decided we want to do something else, something more, uh, preferably something in the in environmental space. And we started meeting. We, we sat down at the Duke. It's a local pub. Lots of business ideas are concocted at the Duke. Some of them are still remembered in the morning. So we were meeting at the Duke, and we um, started throwing around ideas. 
what we wanted to do is find a way that we could take the modern technology that we're seeing around us and apply that to the environmental space. So on April Fool's Day of 2010, we incorporated an MSAT. I know it's an ominous state to start a company. But we started MSAT, and we started looking for what was happening in the environmental space and how we could apply technology. And there's a few things that we found. First of all, we're collecting a lot of environmental data. There's terabytes and terabytes of environmental data sitting out there. It'll be in hard disks, it'll be in diskettes and drives. But a lot of that data is, is collected during an, you know, an environmental assessment or impact assessment or whatever, and it's stored. And we don't have ready access to it all the time. But there's a lot of data. So I'll come back to the amount of data in a second. The second thing we really realize is that there's lots of new sensor technology. Now, sensor technology itself, environmental sensors, are new. I mean, we've had thermometers and barometers since the early 1600s. What is new, though, is they're getting smaller and their capabilities are getting much, much bigger. If you think about it, the modern cell phone, I'd pull mine out of my pocket, but I'm scared it's going to ring. Um, a modern cell phone has a sensor package in it that, you know, 25 years ago would cost $100,000 to install, and now we, we carry them around in our pockets. They've got accelerometers, heart rate monitors, barometers. I mean, you, you think about it. You can, you know, there's more and more sensors being put in these things all the time. So a couple of things about the environmental sensors that we're finding is, first of all, a lot of them are put out into the field. They collect data, and then you go out, someone physically goes out and takes that data back. It gets stored. People use different software packages to get all this data together so that it can be analyzed. Well, that seems a bit silly, considering how much data we're transmitting all the time through the internet and through satellites. So what we wanted to do is provide a software platform that allows people to connect any sensor, any sensor, we're completely sensor agnostic, any sensor system, so that we can stream continuous real-time environmental data back in front of people. So in the same way that you can find out what your friends are having for breakfast in Australia while they're eating it, you can find out whether, you know, what the air quality is like outside before you go for a run. It doesn't matter about how much data there is anymore. With cloud computing and big data solutions, you can capture as much data as you want. And you can provide real-time analytics on top of that data. I told you I like data. Anyway, but this is, I mean, to me, this is like the golden age of data. And in terms of our environment, I mean, really, the Internet of Things and connecting all this together really is going to fundamentally change how we, how we hear about things, about the world around us. It'll be like on Star Trek. You think about it, like years ago, you, you watch Star Trek, they beam down to a planet, they pull out some device, and not unlike a modern mobile phone, they quickly check the atmospheric conditions to make sure the planet was safe. We too will be able to capture data on our cell phones, share that with other people and crowdsource environmental data, or we'll be able to get more information on our phones about the world around us. So all this talk of technology is fantastic and great, but I just want to bring it back to a, a more human level, because a couple of years ago I was at an environmental monitoring conference, and an Aboriginal gentleman from, um, from northern Alberta, he got up to speak. And he said it was fantastic. All these great minds talking about technology and environmental monitoring could have a direct positive impact on his people. But he said what his people really cared about is can they breathe the air? Can they drink the water? And can they eat the fish? So we may not be able to listen to the air, have a conversation with the air. You're not going to open your door tomorrow morning, and the air is going to holler back, what are you at, Mike? <laughs> That's not going to happen. But we can use sensor technology to find out things about our atmosphere that we should know more about. You know, we can give a voice to our oceans. We can find out when they're con contaminated. Our roads and our bridges, they can send emails. We just need to enable them. We only have one planet until we can find another one, but <laughs> so far there's no, no contenders. So we only have one planet, but I believe that through the use of modern technology, we can ensure that the generations that come after us can breathe the air, can drink the water, and eat the fish. Thank you. <laughs>